Okay. Uh, my presentation is going to focus on intergenerational exchange and the future of sustainable land use. So uh, please excuse me, I'm going to start with bad news. The bad news is that at a global scale, farmers are an endangered species. And the sustainable farmers, being a very rare subspecies of farmers, are even more endangered. Sustainable farmers are those uh, who practice uh, sustainable agriculture and livestock production. Uh, in 2016, the average age of an Indian farmer was over 50 years, but it's worse in other countries. In the UK, it's 59, it's 60 in Kenya, and Japan has the highest world average with 67. There's another really worrying indicator. The number of old farmers, meaning those over 65, for each young farmer. This is, there are 33 old ones for each young one in the island of Cyprus, 13 in the UK, eight in the Netherlands, and seven in Greece. Um, there are many reasons for this uh, crisis, the <clears throat> aging population of farmers globally. Uh, and I don't have enough time to discuss them. I'm just going to share some thoughts on the transmission of knowledge and the, the future of sustainable land use. Knowledge and practical skills are fundamental for the continuity of a sustainable agriculture and livestock production. In past generations, knowledge uh, would be passed orally and field skills would be transmitted through practice in the field. But unfortunately, local, uh, local, traditional local ecological knowledge is, um, be, uh, that had been built over centuries can disappear in a single uh, human generation. I always remind that when I see this picture of uh, Arturo Lopez, a wide, very wise man who knew all of the flora of a place where I worked many years ago. Uh, Arturo died and it was like losing an unwritten encyclopedia. Um, throughout the world, the ban on child labor, uh, as we all know, is a very well-intentioned measure, but it does have negative effects. It breaks down the transmission of skills and knowledge that must be acquired in childhood. And let me give you an example. Milking is a very good example because milking, milking is not just a manual skill. Um, when learning how to milk, you build some intuition about aspects uh, related to the neurohormonal control of milk secretion and the transmission of ectoparasites in cows. So we must think about form, uh, formal education that do not uproot the rural children and that do not separate them from rural culture. My first uh, case study takes place in the Western Andes of Colombia, and it, it's related to participatory research that supports community-based restoration of mountain forests. This was a project that took, uh, took place more than 10 years ago, and it supported two community processes uh, through studies of the um, forest structure and composition and the ecology of native trees. The two places are called Bella Vista and El Mesón. At Bella Vista, uh, children participated in the, uh, a study of the phenology of uh, 12 different native tree species. So this is one of the research groups formed by children who studied the phenology of Heliocarpus americanus during 18 months. And I'm going to show you their phenology data. This is how their data look like. They're really amazing and precise data that show the exact time of flowering initiation in July and uh, August, peak flowering in December, seed development in December and January, and then seed dispersal in February. This is a very useful type of information for forest restoration. Uh, research on plant phenology is a learning process that demands rigor and method, and it's very useful to develop cognitive structure. So something that we observed with these very young researchers is that uh, they gained the, they learned lessons for life, patience, learning to wait, admiration for nature, as well as discipline and concentration. And now I'm going to show you what we did at the other place, El Mesón. 
Um, this is an indigenous community, and the fact that we worked there um, was related to um, this community had a life plan that included recovering degraded areas and endangered species through propagation of native trees in nurseries and restoration of community owned lands. So this was our research group, um, uh, the ninth grade teacher and this group of, of indigenous students. And we all worked together in a study of forest structure and composition. Uh, we began with uh, some workshops for the identification of Andean native plants. And here we learned that the indigenous students had a great uh, intuition for plant taxonomy. Then we made, uh, um, we chose our study sites, which were basically all of the forest fragments in the community. Um, all, all of these forests were very important as sources of timber, firewood, and water. Then we went into surveying forest structure and species composition of our reference ecosystem, which was the, um, the more mature and uh, best preserved forest in the area. Um, the students made these fantastic drawings of the forest, uh, of a forest structure in their uh, community. And then we built a reference herbarium. But this is a very different uh, sort of herbarium because we use color photocopies of the pressed plants and they are laminated with plastic on both sides. And this means that uh, the images are very realistic because they preserve the color of the plant specimen and they can be preserved in really moist uh, weather. The, uh, the students used the reference herbarium to ask their elders about the names and traditional uses of native plants. So they went to their grandparents and uncles and parents to try to understand how these plants were used uh, by the indigenous uh, people in the past. Then we used all of this information, the scientific and the traditional knowledge together to choose a series of native species for two very different situations. For starting the restoration of very eroded slopes and for undertaking enrichment planting of secondary growth areas. Um, finally, uh, we, we handed down the herbarium to the community of El Maison. It's stored there for um, community use in the high school library. Um, we did some restoration trials, enrichment planting uh, trials with the students in some community areas. And at the end of the process, we all together wrote a book about the research experience. So this helped us like wrap up all of the, uh, the participatory and intergenerational research process. What we, did we learn about the youth at uh, El Maison? First, that rural children and youth can be trained to answer their questions through the systematic observation of nature. And we also learned that with adequate support, communities can undertake research processes that recover traditional knowledge and at the same time apply the scientific method. My second case study has to do with cattle ranching, and this one is a little bit more complex. It has to do with training, um, training farmers to implement silvopastoral systems and restore degraded lands. So I'm going to discuss the role of innovative producers, pilot farms, and intergenerational exchange. To begin, where do we find the largest opportunity for forest restoration in Latin America? And this is speaking in uh, land use terms. This opportunity is in the extensive cattle ranching lands. We have more than 600 million hectares of these conventional livestock systems, which are mostly degraded pastures that support a very low density of uh, cattle. But we all know that cattle eat much more than grass. They love to browse trees. It's in their nature because they evolved in a forested environment. So silvopastoral systems are agroforestry arrangements that combine fodder plants such as grasses and leguminous herbs with trees and shrubs for animal nutrition and complementary uses. Silvopastoral systems are a shifting paradigm in tropical cattle ranching. Finally, we have understood that the maximum biomass production is not achieved 
in treeless uh, grass monocultures, but rather in agroforests that combine pastures with trees and shrubs. So when we try to rehabilitate uh, cattle ranching lands, we must do several things at, a, at the same time. First of all, we have to increase the productivity and profitability of the farming system using the principles of agroecology. By doing this, we will be enhancing the generation of environmental goods and services. And if we are successful in these endeavors, we will also be able to release the most marginal and fragile lands for the restoration uh, of forests, wetlands, and other ecosystems. Um, during the last years, silvopastoral systems projects have been uh, receiving um, some attention and have been mentioned as successful examples of tropical landscape restoration. For example, this is a paper published in a science uh, journal in 2017. Um, but we must speak about biodiversity in agricultural landscapes. In the Latin America, a large proportion of biodiversity exists outside of protected areas. So agricultural landscapes must be managed in such a way that they complement the role of nature reserves and national parks in safeguarding the region's ex exceptional biodiversity. This means that we, it is impossible to design a system of national parks and reserves that, are able, that will be able to uh, protect all of our biodiversity. We need the farms and we need the farmers to play a complementary role in the conservation of biodiversity in agricultural lands. So uh, farmers, face a lot of challenges. They are trying to transmit their land, but also their values. There is um, a, a growing number of farmers and cattle ranchers who are worried about transmitting their farms, but also their productive projects and values to the next generation. And they are trying to do so against accelerating trends of urbanization and youth migration. These landowners face huge challenges. They are trying to enhance the sustainability and resiliency of their farming systems. At the same time, they're trying to conserve habitat patches. They are trying to restore degraded land within their properties. And they're trying to motivate their sons and daughters to envision a rural future. Such complex challenges demand much more than unique skills and knowledge. They also demand a deep appreciation of the land and of rural culture. So in Latin America, we must transition fast to sustainable cattle ranching. This is, a, this is vital for um, climate change adaptation and for preserving natural ecosystems. However, the continuity of both sustainable ranching and farm scale restoration depend on intergenerational exchange. To guarantee sustainable land use in the future, we must be able to transmit knowledge and values. A good place to start talking about uh, generational exchange is El Atico Nature Reserve, located in the uh, fertile flatlands of the Valle del Cauca in Colombia. El Atico is a family-owned estate that has a very long tradition of dairy farming and sugarcane uh, production. This rural enterprise has been managed continuously by nine generations of a single family. Here we can see Carlos Hernán Molina in 1993 and in 2015. The Molinas are the only Colombian family that has four generations of veterinarians. So we can really talk about intergenerational exchange with this family. Um, El Atico has played a very important role in innovation for sustainability. They pioneered the adoption of silvopastoral systems in the 1970s and intensive silvopastoral systems in the 1990s. And then they designed the protocol for organic sugarcane production and shared it with the sugarcane sector. Um, 
they have two very strong commitments. First, to the generation of knowledge on sustainable agriculture and livestock production. And second, to sharing this knowledge. El Atico is an open farm that shares uh, its research results with a large number of research centers, networks, universities, farmers, and decision makers from Colombia and from different countries. I'm going to talk to you about a project called Mainstreaming Biodiversity into Sustainable Cattle Ranching. Its Spanish name is Proyecto Ganadería Colombiana Sostenible. This project, which ended in January, promoted the adoption and, uh, of environmentally friendly silvopastoral systems that enhance farm productivity, natural resource management, and the delivery of environmental services. This initiative tried to scale up and integrate silvopastoral systems with ecological, uh, conserva ecological restoration and conservation in five Colombian landscapes. Um, what do I mean when I say scaling up? Scaling up means bringing more benefits to more people more quickly and more lastingly. Um, the mainstreaming project took uh, place in the five, five large regions or landscapes that are shown in red in this map. And all of them are located close to protected areas, large protected areas uh, shown in green. But apart from the project areas, there was a series of pilot farms located outside of the project areas. Pilot farms worked very actively in farmer to farmer training. So they played a key role in scaling up the adoption of silvopastoral systems and ecological restoration practices and in promoting a culture of sustainable livestock production. Why are these farms important? There is a simple reason, because seeing is 100 times better than hearing, but touching is a thousand times better than seeing. So nothing replaces the possibility of interacting directly with a farmer with his or her farm. So pilot farms are very important in the generation of knowledge and in farmer to farmer training. They were joint investments of the project and of farm owners to establish and showcase silvopastoral systems together with um, technologies for water management and renewable energy. Uh, they were family enterprises or, or family farms or rural enterprises that stand out for their owners' um, commitment to implementing innovations in, in the livestock system. Uh, they had very clear intergenerational exchange and a sense of belonging to the land. Uh, they facilitated participatory research and monitoring, and they were places where research results were being adapted to specific socioeconomic and environmental conditions, and where new silvopastoral systems and practices were being tested. They were uh, farms that allowed um, the, their information to be shared openly with other farmers. Um, innovative farmers play a key role. We're always searching for innovative farmers. These are people who are curious, familiar with risk as a form of learning, who have the ability to analyze results from different angles, not just the economic one, who are willing to invest in long-term benefits, who are open to a dialogue of knowledge between science and the um, technological and, and uh, traditional knowledge, who value their own knowledge, who are willing to teach and to learn, and who are willing to visit other farmers to see, to verify, and to learn. And by the way, many of them are women. Um, having redefined the relationship with nature, these pilot farmers helped to promote the kind of cultural change that we need to achieve landscape transformation in Colombia. But we all know that cultural change is a long-term process that requires the transfer of both, of both knowledge and values across generations. I'm going to show you one of these pilot farms. It's called La Estancia, and it is located in the, west, in the eastern Andes of Colombia in an area known as the Andean Oak Corridor. It is owned by Isaac Gomez and his wife, uh, Griselda, 
uh, and the process of transforming this farm into a pilot farm began uh, as it always does in, in, in these projects with an exercise of participatory farm planning. In this exercise, the extension workers come together with the whole family to visit the whole property and rethink land use. So through this exercise, the family decided that the areas in green would be dedicated to restoration and they would continue working with the areas in yellow. They would apply the principles of agroecology to intensify uh, sustainable silvopastoral systems. Uh, and I think this is a very brave decision because this, is, this farm has only 10.5 hectares. So they decided to give seven of those hectares back to nature and keep uh, the remaining 3.5 to practice their dairy uh, farming and, and the production of food for the family. So this is how this integration looks in the ground. Uh, um, forests, uh, fragile lands are released for restoration. Um, the dairy farming is intensified with, um, in this case, fodder hedgerows and rotational grazing. And we also see the main uh, principle of sustainable cattle ranching at work, which is that water goes to cattle, not cattle to water. But how does Isaac measure the success of his farming system? He's a very proud farmer and he doesn't like to go to the, to the market to buy food for his family. So for him, it's very important that his farm is able to provide all of the food that the family needs. And with, with this motivation in mind, Isaac designed his civil pastoral system to enhance food sovereignty. Um, he, he implemented many uh, hundreds of, of meters of these fodder hedgerows that combine species for different uses. And all of them have, uh, in the middle, they have trees of special uh, conservation concern. So here we find um, fodder plants for sustainable livestock production. We, we find food plants for food sovereignty, and we find native trees for restoration and connectivity purposes. Isaac also designed this cut and carry fodder and food crop uh, polyculture that combines different species and produces food for his livestock and more food for his family. But I want to focus on the silvopastoral heir. Uh, this farm has a silvopastoral heir called Marisol. Um, Silvopastoral heirs is a movement that tries to ensure cross-generational cultural change. Um, it began with a, with a series of workshops on uh, sustainable cattle ranching and ecological restoration in pilot farms. This first course was offered to the sons and daughters of some leading cattle farmers in Colombia who own pilot farms and are very active trainers of other farmers. This new generation of silvopastoral heirs needs tools and a very strong motivation to continue this task of integrating livestock production with conservation and ecological restoration and teaching other cattle ranchers how to produce milk and beef while enhancing environmental services. So the main objective was to bring together several members of the new generation of silvopastoral cattle ranchers to motivate them by highlighting their families' commitments to sustainable production and restoration, to facilitate the exchange of ideas and motivations between them. Um, we presented the main concepts of forest restoration integrated to sustainable uh, cattle ranching. Uh, we explained the principles of agroecology and the practices of silvopastoral systems. We highlighted the value of local species for restoration and silvopastoral projects. Uh, we re reflected on the human values behind the sustainable livestock production and restoration, and we formed uh, the Colombian uh, network of silvopastoral heirs. It froze here, it's not moving. Okay. <laughs> So silvopastoral heirs are children, teens, and adults 
who gradually and voluntarily receive from their elders a legacy of principles and values grounded in the love for the land and who, who strive to give continuity to their family projects. They have agreed on their mission as to generate and disseminate a culture of production in harmony with nature, to preserve and enrich the natural heritage, and to improve the quality of life of their families. And I'm going to show you the values and principles that the um, civil pastoral heirs have agreed to follow. First, they understand the ecological, economic, and social context of their farms, regions, and agroecosystems. Second, and very important, they know how to do things with their hands. They agreed to respect all forms of life, even though we tried to convince them that this is not possible in cattle ranching, but they insisted that they wanted to respect all forms of life. They understand that livestock production, agriculture, and conservation are interlinked and thus cannot function independently. They persevere in their effort to improve the farming system in harmony with nature. Um, they preserve their sense of wonder and, they, uh, and their curiosity, and they investigate and learn from their mistakes. They try to engage other community members in the process. Um, and they have agreed to be um, generous in teaching, but humble in learning. They maintain this, their sense of belonging to the land, no matter where they are. Um, they share their ideas with others and cultivate uh, team work. They foster a dialogue of knowledge around conservation and sustainable food production and they pass the family legacy on to future generations. They understand that land management is a temporary task that entails a responsibility to society and to future generations. They propose solutions and are not afraid of novel ideas. So these are my final words about this case study. Uh, pilot farms and innovative farmers are the backbone of a cultural shift towards sustainable livestock production that facilitates forest restoration. However, to ensure a long-lasting change, it is also necessary to strengthen the capacities of this new generation of silvopastoral heirs. Uh, and for this, we need to uh, understand some principles about intergenerational learning. Intergenerational learning opens up a space for generations to learn about each other and to understand each other's perspectives. It enables the intergenerational transmission of knowledge, skills, competencies, attitudes, and habits. And in, this happens in both directions from the younger to the older generations and the other way around. But we, we must be able to create conditions for this intergenerational uh, learning to happen. Ideal conditions include, for example, knowledge and skills of all the people involved should be valued and welcome. People should be able to come together with a collective interest in a certain topic, the topic or common aims. And an atmosphere of respect and openness for new experiences should prevail. Such environments should allow for learning about one's own generation and about others. It is very important to understand that intergenerational learning is reciprocal all generations involved act as learners and teachers at the same time. So participants meet without any kind of hierarchy. Thank you. That was all. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I can answer any questions or comments if you have.